We have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Markets have been crazy. The world seems like it's crazy. Uh, but first, I'm going to I'm gonna ask you a question that I was asked by my seven-year-old. Okay. If you could go to speak, if you could go to outer space, would you go? <laughs> I'm going to probably have to defer on that. And that might have to deal. That's a no? It's a no. Oh. It sounds like a really cool thing. Now, don't get me wrong. And like, it, it would be fun. Maybe it would depend upon how good the technology is because we, we had that exploration of the submarine that went down. Remember I uh, was doing the exploration probably in June. I think it was you're, you're leaving January 1st on Falcon heavy for a three day trip to the international space station and back. I'm passing. Oh, okay. Well, first of all, first of I'm all, going. I don't for know. Like d- doesn't the um, training sound pretty exhaustive in terms of like what you have to do to get to space. It's not just like I'm putting my space, I'm going to, you know, put on a space suit and like go, go on, go on the rocket ship one day. Right. Uh, it, no, it, I just figured they had to measure my big noggin for a helmet. and we're <laughs> it, it, it seems like you have to be in fairly good shape and there's a lot that goes along with it to, to be in that, that sort of uh, training. I'm not so sure that I'm, I'm willing to do that. The G forces that you would have to be put through. Like, like Joe Perry is, fresh and in shape and ready to go but you and i maybe are not that's yes i guess yes yes. okay well we'll have to ask joe next time he joins us on this if he's they show like top gun and they show like the g-forces and like what it does to you and like how you could black out and i'm like that that's only one level of this you're going on you're going on a spaceship okay so so it's the train how how did you answer this question Uh, yes i would say yes i'm going okay Okay. Uh, I might be adverse to the training, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about the thing blowing up. I'm out of here. Let's go. <laughs> All right. We have a lot to cover just given what's kind of going on with markets. So let's not waste any more time. You ready to roll? Yes. Let's do it. Okay. Um, we, if you are watching or listening for the first time in a while, Uh, Welcome to the Casual Friday, colon, Financial Insights podcast, webcast, video podcast, whatever it is. I'm Brian Ullman. I'm a financial advisor here at Ford Financial Group. I'm joined, uh, as usual, by Ryan Louie, also a financial advisor here at Ford Financial Group. And in this podcast, we kind of, we try to stick with the formula (laughs) of a quick market recap, go over a couple of charts and then talk about what's on our mind here lately. Um, let now's as good as any time, I suppose. And and frankly, we will probably be consumed for most of this podcast with market recap. Um, we can kind of maybe maybe be easiest if I shared a little bit of what markets are looking like right now. Um, Ryan, are you, I trust you're able to see this here on, uh, let me get it posted up. There we go. There we go. Um, nope, that's not the right tab. That's the S&P. I'm trying to share my screen here. Is that, oh, there we go. So here's the S&P 500 and the 10-year yield. Um, maybe let's just take a look and see what's going on with today's markets all together. Um, using Coifin to take a look. Here is um, purple is the NASDAQ, um, up 33% still on the year. Uh, S&P 500 up only 10% on the year. The Dow and Russell both broke negative on the year. I can't really zoom in here, but you can see we're below that line. Um, So we have one major index uh, negative for 2023 after being negative in 2022. I think what a lot of people are looking at are the last few months here. This is June through October. NASDAQ's down 4%. S- uh, Dow's down about 4%. S&P down almost 5%. The Russell even worse still. Um, let's do this one better uh, and say from the peak July 31st through today, yikes, it gets even worse. Basically, all three indices are down somewhere between 7 and 8%. Um, we are, we are teetering on a correction, aren't we? Yeah. And timing, 
I'll say this too. Sometimes the timing from a client standpoint can be kind of t- um, this, this one's a little bit more difficult because the top of the market was the end of one month. So really you felt the fall through August and through September. Sometimes it bleeds into like the high was in the middle of the month. Yep. Clients don't pay attention to what's happening to their balances for the most part um, in the middle of the month, unless you're logging online. Um, definitely it's not going to show up on a statement that your high was in the middle of the month, but the high happened to be at the end yeah. of one month or the beginning of the, of the other month. And so it truly is reflective of clients seeing a high to where we are today, which is a very a much lower point over the last two months. Yeah. I mean, um, even so, uh, one of the things is the NASDAQ is market weighted, but if you even look at the, uh, if you, the yellow line here is the, um, equal weighted S and P the RSP, um, down, even this is just in the last five days, but you look at the last three months and even on the year, it's negative for the year, year to date, RSP is negative. Um, it's almost as if the mega cap techs are what's holding everything together. Correct. Uh, uh, for, for our, for our year to date performance, um, People, people they, can't be happy. I know. I mean, it. this is painful. It's a painful correction after we thought we were going to get some relief here this year. Yeah. To put this in the context, um, I think that if you're looking at just like the S&P 500 specifically, um, it's a bit deceiving because a lot of the numbers out there are kind of throwing out, you know, if, if you take out the top, you know, seven stocks, which are really leading the wave, right? Right, right, right. now. Um, the other like 493 are only up. They may they were only up a couple percent of most recently. You take in the last couple of days, they're probably teetering on being break even to maybe even being down. So again, it is really just the very top technology stocks that have kept things um, up. Everything else has, as a whole, has has struggled. Well, I'll even do you one better. There are only there are three names that are in the top that are that make up twenty the twenty twenty five percent of the Nasdaq one hundred. Three. Yeah. I mean, it's it's Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon, and so you look at saying the Nasdaq's up still thirty three percent. Well, a quarter of that performance is from three names that it's done pretty well this year. Now, granted, the Nasdaq was down a heck of a lot more than everything else was last year, so maybe there was more room to rebound. Right. Um, but I would say that we are headed in. If if is it's likely we will soon be in a correction, a technical correction, 10% from the top is what a technical correction is. Um, and so this begs the question, why? What do you think? What do you think is going on here? I think this is all driven by yields, which we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, again, interest, interest rates, yields, Federal Reserve, those type of things continue to drive the markets. Yep. Um, you know, again, we didn't throw up their bonds. Bonds obviously are not something usually where most people ever talk about. Again, you, you turn on the news and they're talking about the Dow, the S&P and the NASDAQ. Um, you, you almost never will hear people or the markets talk about the bonds, but they're, they're very, very relevant right now. Again, especially the last couple, two, three months, yeah. as they too have been hit really, really hard, um, just like the stock market has. Yeah. Um, well, here I'll I'll share I'll share the screen again here, and I've added in. Um, I can't take out the Dow, but maybe I'll change the color to to purple or something to get it out of there. But the green and the and the pink here are the ag so the bar, the um, aggregate bond index, and the LQD is the um, intermediate term corporate bond in uh, fund, uh, both down two and a half, roughly two and a half percent on the year um, in the last three months. LQD is down six and a half percent, and the AG is down same as the S and P five hundred nearly. Um, and that's bond- the surprising thing for clients, right? Is that you're yeah. saying you're seeing the markets go down; they're going pretty consistently. Most people, when they look at their statements, are thinking, "Oh man, the market must be really bad." And it, it's not that it's good; it is bad, but it's that your bonds are contributing just as much as your stocks are at the last couple months. Well, and the bonds never had the run up over the summer to be able to create that buffer. So, right, you go up thirty percent, you come down ten, you're still up twenty on the year. Uh, the bonds didn't shoot way ahead and so when they lose six percent or five percent or four percent over these last few months you're scrubbing out any of the returns that you had earlier in the year um and i think where it hurts people the most is the most conservative investors are the ones who have the ugliest returns on their quarterly statements here at the end of september and it's hard it's hard to watch 
Right. Um, so what what is driving this? This may be a good place to take a look at your dot plot. Yeah. Right. So um, w- walk us through what the dot plot is for people. that. We, I think we've talked about this before, but like uh, this is the um, basically the, the chair people of, um, of the Federal Reserve that are making what they're predicting in the future is going to be interest rates. So they kind of break these out by years. The dots represent a person's vote or opinion on where they think interest rates will be at that specific time. So you can see, you know, year by year, they vary. Now, of course, 2023 on the left, you can see it's pretty tight. We're, we're at the very tail end of 2023. You're not going to see a wide dispersion between what people think interest rates are going to be like by the end of this year. And so you can see that most of the people are voting um, kind of in that five and a half percent area. But as we go forward, you know, the, the votes kind of scatter scatter along and they um, disperse a little bit more. But what we try to gauge from this is, you know, what by looking at these thoughts, you're trying to look at kind of what the midpoint is to kind of guess what these individuals that have to deal with interest rate policy, um, that's their job, um, what, what they think the interest rates are going to be like in the future. And if you were just to take this snapshot, this is the most recent one, September 20th. Um, right. You can't necessarily gauge anything from this and to get necessarily the reason why this is um, causing problems for the market. But if you were to look at where we were, you know, nine months ago and compare it to this, it would start to tell a different story, which is we had originally thought, with, based upon these dots, um, that interest rates were going to go down sooner than what they are telling us now. And that's the big difference here is, again, the Fed is saying interest rates are going to stay higher for longer. Um, and that was a different story now than what we were originally thinking, the, the, what the market was pricing in, in January, February, March. Right. And so um, this has led to a lot of volatility, again, for both bonds and stocks. Yeah. I mean, if you can get, um, well, and this is looking at the Fed, this is looking at the Fed fund rate. Um but it, and so there's some, I mean, obviously they're projecting it lower into the future. Even if you look at futures here in the nearer term, I think it's pretty unlikely that the Fed's going to raise rates in November. It's a possibility still, maybe a coin flip in December. But once we get into um, March or May of their meeting next year, uh, the we start to get real numbers of of investors betting that the Fed's going to cut rates next year, as they're kind of showing by this. But right now, it feels like we're we're max pain, um, you know, through all of this. I'll even show you another chart. I'm going to share my screen here again. Um, so I got the background is white, so maybe it's a little bit easier to see now. But this is the ten year Treasury versus the bar, the aggregate bond index. And you can see it almost operates perfectly inversely, which makes sense, right? With um, bonds move the opposite direction of of yields. And so the 10-year treasury yield is up at about 4.8%. And you can see kind of right where they started to come together and then really diverge. And it's like a mirror image of each other. Um, Rates driving um, bonds down. and the same the the same effect is is true kind of with stocks also you can see here s and p five hundred the it, it it starts to look a lot like um the bond yields uh or the i'm sorry the aggregate bond index where you have the s and p just moving in opposite directions um as interest rates climb higher and interest rates are spiking right now um i mean i think there's worries that it's not just the federal reserve but Inflation, keeping the reserve, Federal Reserve rates higher for longer. Um, worries about what's going on in the future and requiring higher rates to have people invest in 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 bonds. Right? We just got. We're recording this Tuesday afternoon, and the uh, for the first time ever, the Speaker of the House was essentially kicked out. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty out of the, out there, and if you're going to invest, you need to be compensated for that, and it's certainly getting reflected in yield. And yeah, so I think the opposite when, is happening with bonds and, and stocks across the board. Yeah, when yields are high, you know, um, clients will see a 5% interest, 5.5% interest. And, you know, at that point, you'd make that decision. Do I want to take a easy 5.5%, um, you know, with l- low to no risk and 
or do I want to go to the stock market and try to get a little bit higher, but take on a lot of risk? And so that's the problem that we're we're dealing with right now is that you know, risk is coming off the table because people can go and move their money into something more conservative. Um, and then on the other side, again, as we mentioned, h- higher interest rates just lead to less spending. So, the, of course, the stock market is not going to like this. If the interest rates are higher for longer, it just means that there's probably going to be less economic activity because borrowing is so much more difficult. And more well, costly. I mean, a mortgage, a 30 year mortgage is 8% now versus sub three, just about a year and a half ago. Um, and you, no one's buying, no one's, you're going to use a, an 8% mortgage unless you're just dying to have to move into something. But well, if, if you have to move anyone work, else that has an option, work. yeah, yeah, no one, anyone that has an option, they can't, they probably can't afford it or they're just not willing to, you know, to, to buy a house that's going to be tied to a mortgage that's, that's, that's high. So, so all of this is pretty pessimistic. So rates are moving higher, stifling economic activity, slowing growth. Probably we're going to get earnings here in another uh, two weeks ish. Um, so we're so it could be you know um, hurting corporate earnings, which matters with stock prices, et cetera, et cetera. Plenty of bad news, but I think a lot of times it's important for us to be contrarian to a degree. So when things are good, they're never as good as they seem, and when things are bad, they're never as bad as they seem. And right now it feels as though things, um, people feel things are, are about as bad as they can get. Um, and I would, I would argue that, um, we're, we're just not, we're not quite there. Um, I'm going to show you, are you familiar with the fee fear and greed index, Ryan? Yeah, I've seen it. This is, this is from, this is from CNN. It's the fear and greed index. And we are we a month ago we were uh, here in the greed category, and 30 days later we are in extreme fear. So pessimism has crept into the markets. It almost is starting to feel like we're at that capitulation point where people are going to start getting out of everything. Um, and usually when we're down this low, things are overdone. Um, this is yeah. It's like any today. When you're at one end of the uh, one end of the spectrum, the only other direction that you can go is the opposite. Yeah. Um, well, and interestingly, the last time we were we were actually below this, but we were the last time we were this far was in um, uh, we were at seven uh, seventeen on the index at the end of, uh, around October a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, and that was the market bottom still for this bear market that we just had. And then more recently, we were close to that in the middle of March when we had the banks failing that we have talked about before. Uh, so, yeah, uh, there was, a, there was another index I saw that w- just measured oversold, not, not, not a uh, fear and greed. I think the, the index here has a little bit more into it, other components, but one well, of the components I saw was just like how much selling is going on. And the, the last time we were this low was October. Actually it was the same, exactly almost the same time this year. Yep. I mean, last year, um yep. and again that was we had a rally we did have a rally after that we did have a rally after that and october was the bottom i think it was october 22nd if i if i remember correctly now this is market momentum breath puts and calls and volatility and vix and stuff and i don't know how scientific this is not tradable like actionable information but it does give you a tone of markets and it is as about as pessimistic I, it this seems right to me we are about as pessimistic investors are as pessimistic as they've been in about a year, I think there were a little. There was a little bit of fear going on, but not necessarily pessimism with the bank stuff earlier this year. Um, I think some of the difficulty, though, is that um, we went through this last year, and so I think a lot of people thought we were we were done with this difficulty, right? But here we are back again, still positive for the year for some people. Maybe if you have only bonds in your portfolio, you're actually negative for the year. Um, but it, it's. It, we've got some pessimism. I do think that as things get prolonged, it, um, it gets harder, right? Like it's, it's sometimes easier to rip off the bandaid. And it's maybe we could have, if, if the markets were okay this year, we would, we would have looked back and said, Hey, 2023, <clears throat> 2022 was a, was a tough year. Um, but you know, it was a year long or maybe realistically it was, you know, nine months long. And then things got, things got better after that. Now we're running into year two. 
because we're kind of trading backwards. Yep. And it feels like, oh man, we've been at this for you know for a while now, and the markets just aren't aren't doing well. Yeah, like we took our medicine, now things should be better, and they're they're not necessarily. And you can even see it. Um, we've shown this chart for the stocks before, but these are the uh, annual returns and intra-year declines for the uh, aggregate bond index. And you can see here, uh, if you're looking on the far right, uh, these last two years were the first time in history we've had two negative years in a row. And it's real possible we would even get a third here still. Um, and so it's e it's easy to see why people would become impatient here uh, because we haven't had a negative year since, what, 2013 um, prior to this stretch. And before that, it was like, I mean, we have there are years, if not decades in between negative years on the bond index and we're getting them back to back to back. Um, and the same thing could be said, could be true of, I didn't pull up the stock one for this, but you know, um, well, the interesting thing about, you know, historically with the, with the ag and negative year returns is that the following year has that rubber band effect where you're down one year and then you look at the next year and you're like, Whoa, you really? we, had a, we had a really good year. It almost makes you forget the negative year by having, you know, a, a, a follow-up year that is so good. Yep. And and then we are here at the point where it's been consecutive years of struggle. Yeah, it's easy the, to see why people years. become exhausted by this, right? Yes. Um, so we're kind of go bouncing back and forth between stocks and bonds because everything's having a difficult time and there isn't a real place to hide. And a lot of people are taught that stocks and bonds are negatively correlated, which is to say they go one goes up the other goes down and vice versa and when things get real choppy that doesn't happen and it didn't happen last year and it's only happening to a degree this year because stocks went up in the first half whereas bonds didn't but now they're kind of both going down at the same time so you're not getting that diversification here's where some other good news can come in and you talked se seasonality mm -hmm. uh, before and i'm going to link this is from All Star Charts. I'm um, the charts created by us. I'm not going to link in here, but I will link um, some of the slides that we've used here, whether it's the Fear and Greed Index and some other things, so we can reference those. Um, but this is a seasonality chart that we've talked about. You talked about it. Uh, was it last week or two weeks ago? Um, I know uh, some of the guys at the Carson Group are always talking about seasonality. Um, I heard someone today describe this is the climate, not the weather. So you're not predicting what's happening. You're just saying, hey, historically, this is what happens. Right, right. Historically, it doesn't rain today, but sometimes it may once in a while. Um, but we are following the seasonality chart kind of almost to a T, aren't we? We're, the S&P is getting August was lousy. September is lousy. And we're headed into what could be the best stretch of the year. Um, yeah. You, and September, is, you know, this is going, what, 70 plus years of, of returns. But yeah. Um, you know, actually the last four, the four September's we've had have been really tough. Um, going back to 2020, we were down 4%, 5%, 9%. And then this year about 5%. Mm. So September's the more, of the most recent have been even worse than, um, they have been uh, historically, but they've been followed up by really good fourth quarters, fourth quarters. Yeah. the last three years. We are now hopefully going to, you know, we are hoping for, a fourth quarter that is going to help us uh, kind of salvage, salvage. Uh, so humor here. me here. Envision this. We, we, we peaked in July. <clears throat> we got pummeled in August and September. We get into October. The jobs data isn't, it's like Goldilocks, not too hold, not too hot, not too cold. We get into earnings season in a couple of weeks. Earnings are better than expected. We get into November. Fed says they're not going to, they're going to pause on rate hikes and they even get a little bit dovish in their language suggesting that they're done altogether. I mean, that that recipe right there would be enough to make markets push higher and maybe even bonds come off of, of the beating that they've had also and have, you know, yields on the 10 year start dropping a little bit, I would think. Yeah, I kind of feel like that if we have a, a stock rally that there's a there's a very good chance that the bonds move at least upwards, not not, you know, Bonds don't move at a very fast speed, but I do think that they'll move upward. So it would be, you know, this is the kind of ending that we would we we kind of desperately need at, at this point is both both bonds and stocks have a good rally to the last three months. Although yeah. again, the last couple of days and for to start the quarter have been have been rough. Yeah, and and I think from a technical standpoint, even most indicators that we look at remain bullish, which implies that this is a correction. 
not the beginning of a bear market for stocks at the very least. Um, so, I mean, I think we keep, that's why not being reactive after a bad six or eight weeks is, is paramount here. Um, I, I, I think this is probably a good chance for us to kind of pivot and say, uh, what's on your mind right now? Um, I'm, I, I've got two, but I'm going to begin with one. So before sure. we get too deep into this, uh, one of them is our webinar that's coming up. This is what's on my mind and what should be on everybody's mind. We've got Bryce Gill from First Trust. Uh, he's an economist at First Trust talking markets and the economy on October 17th. And so I'm going to link to our webinar in the notes below the YouTube video, in the show notes of the podcast, uh, where you can register to get Bryce's take on what's going on uh, with the economy and with markets. So that's one. That's Tuesday, October 17th at 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, that's one of the things that's on my mind. Uh, Ryan, oh, what is on your mind? So um, I, you know this. My, wa- my wife is a avid runner. That might be yeah. putting it lightly. Um, she, my wife uh, runs six, six, seven days a week. She runs marathons all, all year round. Um, I play travel agent. <laughs> so, oh. so she, so last night she, I we're about 13 months away from the New York marathon that she's going to run. She's going to run it next year. Um, so I was, you know, on my computer trying to plan out the, the hotel stays, trying to maximize points, you know, et cetera sure. for, for the stay. And she, she then says to me, Oh my goodness, I just got into the Tokyo marathon. Oh, really? and I'm like, I'm booking New York right now and now I have to book Tokyo, which is five months from now. So New York's 13 months from now, which I had time to plan for. Then she throws on top of it, you know, oh, we got to, we now need to to start planning for Tokyo in five months, which puts you in a scramble because again, shorter time frame, you know, hotels are already starting to get booked up. Yeah. Um, you're like, and you're also saying, honey, let me check the markets real quick. See what's going on. See if yeah, we can right, do this. Right. So no, it's uh, I'm, I'm, I get it as the spouse of a runner, I get to play. And the, the one that kind of takes care of travels, yeah. I'm uh, playing travel agent right now. So that's where I'm spending my time trying to organize all of this in a short, short amount of time. Now. There you go. Yeah. What's up with you? Um, I, so I'm not going to, I've started the Elon Musk book. It's long. And so far, I've read the other biography, so there's not a whole lot of, whole lot different. I just got the Michael Lewis book on, um, on FTX last night. Okay, uh, and so I haven't cracked it yet. I'm interested to look at it and read it. Um, it it is being described online as kind of a puff, uh, puff piece for um, Sam Bankman-Fried. Yeah. yeah. Um, or in his defense. So that'll be interesting to read because I don't think it was, I, well, FTX wasn't necessarily a Ponzi scheme in the classic sense, but there was some ineptitude leading up to malfeasance almost, I think was going on there. I'm very curious to read the Michael Lewis book, but that's also not what's on my mind. Uh, all of the AI engines, or many of them have started allowing image creation on them. So okay. before, if you were using AI to create images, you had to do mid journey or dolly, but it was some separate thing. You kind of had to be tech focused. Now you can go on Bing and just type in what you want and it will produce pretty surprising images. So I did it and it was easy and it was incredible. So I told it, make a rhino dressed in all white at Wimbledon with a wooden tennis racket. And here you go. Not bad, right? No, not bad. This is like a two sentence thing. More rhinos playing tennis at Wimbledon. Like for our newsletter, I could just, (laughs) I don't have to worry about copyright infringement. I just have these bots create images. Moreover, I thought- have you messed around putting like your own, can you put your own images and then have it do modifications or is you it can, only? You can, they're, they're different apps. That's not on the same thing, but we're getting this AI image generation. And what I said was, okay, and put a bunch of middle-aged men screaming about the stock market going down and it produced this. Um, <laughs> and so I said, okay, I, I'm surprised this is middle age. These guys look old age, but I mean, this is <laughs> wild, right? 
Yeah, and so then cool, I said, man. make him not, ye- not, not screaming, but like yelling or something like that. And it turned confused. Yeah. So this is more <laughs> animation, different kinds of animation here. And then yes, ah. <laughs> a I'm not this thin. B I've never ridden a motorcycle in my life, but yes, you can upload yourself and do AI image generation. Um, so it's kind of fun, kind of wild. If you are an animator or a graphic designer, I could see why you are very concerned right now. If now, granted, this isn't as good as what can be done. It, it, you know, this is basic level, but compared to what was able to have been done six months ago. But this is at your fingertips, though. So, so at it's, your fingertips. It's quickly. I did these on my phone, and just. Um, and there are others. I mean, I had, oh, do I have another one in here? I thought I did. Um, I did one where it's like a lion playing basketball. And it was just animated, like a kid's animation. Um, the, the more detailed you are in your instruction, the more detailed it is. So I did a rhino riding a moped on the streets of Paris wearing a red beret. <laughs> it was like there. It happens. Uh, yeah. And I was trying to be as nonsensical as I could, and it was doing it. Um, so that's fun. It's AI is there. on my mind. This is fun, but it is uh boy, we're headed into a strange world if we're not already there. That's what's on my mind. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we'll leave it there. We um we might we'll we we'll do another one of these in two weeks. We'll see where we are. Um, in between this one and the next one is our webinar though. Um, and so again, I'll link, I'll link the registration in the notes for the podcast and, uh, here on YouTube, if you're watching this, um, and so you can, uh, join us and our clients and listening to one of the economists at first trust break down what they see going on and why, um, and what's ahead. And, uh, I think it's going to be an interesting, an interesting, uh, webinar. Yeah, I think it's good for clients to, you know, we we have some insights, you know, we have some thoughts. A lot of stuff is what we read, but, you know, an economist takes on a whole different level, multi, you know, levels, levels above the, the stuff that we read on a daily basis and follow. So it's it's really good to, you know, hear what they have to say about how things are going. And Yeah. Well, as, as advisors, we are a little bit of jack of all trades because you have to be kind of an armchair economist. You have to be a, a student of markets, but you also, uh, you and I are certified financial planners. So we're putting together financial plans for clients, mapping out 10, 20, 30 years for them and kind of where where they stand and what a market like this actually does to their finances, as opposed to just being scared about your statement. You say, okay, well, does this actually put me off track? But that what that means is when we're focused on clients, portfolios, and retirement plans, yes, we understand economics to a degree, but we are not economists. So it's going to be interesting to hear a different voice um, other than ours to kind of get their take on what's on what's ahead. I, I do get the first trust stuff. Um, I haven't read Bryce a whole lot lately, but um, I know they're not. If you're looking for pessimism, you might be able to find it two weeks from now <laughs> or, or on the 17th. So we'll see. Um, all right, Ryan, we'll leave it there. All right. Thank Until you. the next one.